So welcome everyone to um, the, this transportation uh, seminar that we planned. And it's a pleasure and it's an honor to uh, welcome uh, Prof Professor John Pucher and Professor Ralph Bühler. And um, uh, and it's it's a, it's an honor. So yeah, things are popping up in front of my face. So I'm not sure, sure, sure uh, to make sure I'm concentrating. So Professor, if if anybody is is in the in the field of cycling around the world, and mu he must have read. Uh, the, the papers and the great work that was being developed over the past, I don't know how many years, at least 20 years <laughs> I've been reading the work uh, from Ralph and John, and it has been amazing, and we all learn a lot from them, and it's a great honor, and thanks to them for agreeing to be part of, um, of this seminar, and to come and to give us some of their, their time, to talk about their uh, recent book uh, that they just published, their findings from some of the research that they have been doing all over the world. And it's, it's, an, it's a pleasure and an honor. I can't express how happy I am to get like two superstars in the field of transport to be together and to come and to talk to students. And thank you also for opening it up to uh, the public. So it's not just the students at McGill are uh, enjoying this or learning from it. It's also people from outside. If anybody have any questions, please type them down in uh, the chat. Uh, I'll be asking questions at the end and I will be opening it also for some of you to uh, uh, ask questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, for now, I'd like to pass it to uh, Ralph and, and John and, and it's all yours. And thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming and, and talking to us. Okay, Ralph, are you starting the PowerPoint? Yes, go ahead. I just don't see it. <laughs> Why it don't takes, I see the PowerPoint? It takes a couple of minutes. Oh. Okay. Two seconds, some things like the admissions and things take some. Okay, I just need to, right, wait just one sec, because I'm seeing it. Uh, give me one second. Um, full screen. Okay. It should be there now. It should be. I'm just not getting the, the whole screen. I'm not sure how to. When it says view, and I want the standard. Oh, now I got it. I got it. I got it. OK, got you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it only takes a little while to get set up here. Uh, well, I'm John Pooker, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, El uh, Ganidi for inviting Ralph and me to give this talk at McGill University. Uh, I have to make a confession, and that is that Montreal is one of my favorite places in all of North America. Uh, so I'm especially pleased to give this talk in your wonderful city there in uh, La Belle Province, uh, uh, Quebec. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Lancelot Rodrigue, who is uh, helping us out on the technical end uh, of all this presentation. Uh, already in this first slide that you're looking at, you can see a bit about the topic of our talk. Uh, it's obviously about cycling, uh, no surprise about that, uh, but especially from the perspective of sustainability. That's why sustainability is in the title, uh, in all of its dimensions, and how cycling can contribute to more sustainable transport systems in more livable cities. Our talk is also about cycling for everyone. We should speak a motto or even a battle cry, I would say, for, for Ralph and for me over the past two decades. For me, it's been actually about 25 years, so even more than two decades. Uh, as you can see on the title slide, cycling can be made possible for a wide variety of groups, uh, all ages and abilities, and for a variety of trip purposes. We'll get into that more later. Uh, this talk is based mainly on our new book for MIT Press, Cycling for Sustainable Cities. But we've also updated information in many respects. And we've also expanded here and there uh, to include walking when, when possible, when we have the updated data. Uh, 
walking, after all, is the other very, very sustainable mode of, of urban travel. I think it's important to remember that really uh, cycling and walking and public transit together form a package of sustainable alternatives to the automobile. You can't just have cycling, you can't just have walking, you can't just have public. They really need to work together as an integrated package uh, uh, to, to the private automobile. Okay, then let's go to the first slide. Okie dokie, well, <laughs> just so you can see it, well, not only so you can see it, but also because it makes a, an important point. Uh, and that is, uh, th this is the, the cover uh, of, of the book. Um, and we chose this cover for the photo for the cover for a very important reason. This is everyday cycling in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. And as you can see, there's a lot of cycling. This is not a mass event. And you can sort of see that because on the right hand, you'll, you'll see the, there's a, a green traffic light. Um, and so it just happens to be the green phase uh, for the cyclists to proceed over this particular, uh, I think it's a bridge actually. Uh, you'll see also what's important in the photo is there's as many women as men cycling uh, and they're, they're riding very normal bikes. They're, these aren't fancy schmancy bikes. These are very normal everyday you call bikes, comfort bikes. So, um, they're carrying things. They're, you can see they have baskets on the front uh, or they're carrying uh, backpacks. Uh, and uh, I'm all in favor of wearing bike helmets, but it is interesting that the Dutch feel so safe cycling there in the Netherlands that uh, virtually no one wears a bike helmet. I don't want to get into a, that really controversial issue, uh, but, but that's just how safe cycling is and, and how safe it feels uh, in the Netherlands. Okay, next slide. Well, that word sustainability really is an important one in the book. Uh, so we examine uh, many of the, in this case, three categories of aspects of sustainability in terms of cycling. Uh, by the way, I would just like to emphasize, we had something like 40 or 43, I think, uh, chapter co-authors um, and authors who contributed to this book. So this was not just an effort by Ralph and me. We had uh, public health professors, we had urban planning professors, transportation professors, engineers, planners, a, a wide variety of people from all over the world. I think there were something like 15 different countries um, and several, I think four different continents. So we had quite a geographic range. At any rate, okay, now to the point. <laughs> uh, cycling is definitely environmentally friendly. That's sort of the no brainer. Uh, that won't surprise any of you. There's almost almost no pollution, uh, no air pollution or noise pollution, of pollution from cycling, and very little in the way of non-renewable resources used, basically just uh, the bike itself. Uh, economical, uh, we're talking about very low private as well costs. Uh, so for the individual, you can certainly uh, buy a bike for cost. You don't have to pay $10,000 for a carbon fiber um, I think that's what they're called. <laughs> um, and then uh, their economic, in terms of the, from my point of view and an individual point of view, uh, and this is related to one of the points down below, but you can save on health costs. Uh, you as an individual can be healthier and that then reduces medical costs for society as a whole. And there have actually been estimates. It's, it's you know, many, many billions of dollars uh, of uh, economic benefits, health benefits. Um, one of the aspects of sustainability that often gets overlooked is social sustainability. So cycling um, is it's equitable, it's socially sustainable in that it's financially affordable uh, for almost everyone. It's physically possible for, for most people, uh, not for everyone, but it's physically possible for most people. Uh, and you know, above a certain age or with certain kinds of physical disabilities, you can't bicycle, but, but for most people it is possible. Uh, and as we'll see later, uh, if you look at the Dutch or the Danes or the Germans, uh, a lot of, uh, of them who were over 70 or 75 years old bike every day. Um, also one of the, we have chapter three, which is written by four public health professors, really world renowned public health professors, and they examined the health benefits uh, of cycling from uh, various perspectives. They examined the physical health benefits. That's sort of the one that everyone expects. Obviously, it's, it's healthy to be cycling. 
Uh, but something that sort of blew me away, I mean, I, it didn't really blow me away, but it just was su the surprising just how large these benefits are. The mental and the social health benefits from physical activity really does uh, keep you more alert. It, it makes you more optimistic. It makes you feel better. Uh, you're more likely to smile. I mean, it, it really makes a difference. I, I'm just, there's some sort of things in your brain, serotonins or whatever they are, uh, that gets generated by physical activity. Uh, and then, of course, social health benefits, which I've seen all the time here, you know, especially during COVID. I mean, I have met more people during COVID on my bike rides and walks than, uh, than I ever have before, I think. Uh, so, by the way, all of these benefits, I don't want, I said we don't have it listed for walking, but every single one of these sustainability benefits also applies to walking. Uh, environmentally friendly and sustainable, economically sustainable, socially sustainable. Next one. Well, even though cycling is such a wonderful mode of, of urban travel, a way to get around cities, um, those in the English speaking world don't do a very good job <laughs> of taking advantage of the benefits of cycling. Uh, you can see here that uh, in the United States, uh, look at the second bar for the United States, 1%, that's 1% of all trip purposes. This is the latest national travel survey in the United States. 1% of trips for all purposes are made by bike. That's not many. 0.6% uh, of all work commuters are bicyclists. Um, and that's the figure that you have to use to compare to Australia and Canada, because Australia and Canada don't have national travel surveys and you only have the census. Um, and so this is for Canada and Australia, uh, uh, this is the percentage of work commuters, daily work commuters who get to work by bike. It's 1.4% in both Canada and Australia. So welcome, you're in the same boat, Canada and Australia. The UK is just a slightly higher 1.7. And you got to look at this table and say, what is it about the English language <laughs> that makes us not want to ride a bike? It's, it's absurd. Um, I mean, look, France is twice what you've got in the UK, and they're aiming for really high levels now to prepare for the Olympics in two years. Um, and look at the, all these other countries. I mean, it's sort of a no-brainer when you look at the Netherlands being so high, almost 30%, and then Denmark at 14%, uh, Germany, 11%, and so forth and so on, and Japan at 13%. Uh, and it's even higher in the greater Tokyo area. It's something like 17% of all trips in greater Tokyo uh, are made by bike. It's, it's really incredible. So at any rate, the whole point is there's, there's a huge variation among these countries. All these countries are have high per capita incomes, high levels of car ownership. They're economically developed. These are all OECD countries. So we're not, we're, we're not comparing apples with oranges. These are all very highly developed countries. And you're having these higher levels of cycling in Europe and also in Japan because people are choosing to cycle, not because they have to cycle. Okay, next slide. Um, and now some of you might wonder, well, maybe this is due to trip distance. That is average trip uh, lengths uh, must be so much longer in the United States than they are in, in Europe, Germany, Denmark, or the Netherlands. Well, they're somewhat longer, it's true. On average, uh, urban trips in, this is in urban areas tend to be somewhat longer in the United States than they are in Germany, Denmark, or the Netherlands. Um, but, but even controlling for trip distance, and that is what this graph does. It's saying, okay, let's control, let's standardize for trip distance and look within each trip distance category, what percentage of trips are made by bike. So whether it's less than one kilometer or less than two or three or whatever the trip distance is, you can compare country by country within each trip distance category. And you see in Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, you've got something like 10 to 20 or 30 times the percentage of trips made by bike within each trip distance category. So trip distance is not the main deterrent to cycling in the United States. And just by the way, 40, according to this latest uh, national travel survey, uh, and these are the data from that, 40% of all trips in urban areas, in metropolitan areas, not just a central city, 40% of trips in American metropolitan areas are two miles or shorter, which is certainly short enough to make my bike. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's some good news though. Uh, even if you speak English, <laughs> 
<laughs> Even people who speak English can make progress. Um, I'm just uh, making fun of, uh, of Americans, I suppose. Um, but anyway, uh, well, we're not the only ones speaking English, the Brits too, and the Australians. Okay. If you look at these uh, uh, various cities, so there's about uh, 15 or 20 cities here. Um, and what you find is uh, many cities that had no history at all uh, of cycling, such as Chicago or New York or, or London, um, and even, even Paris. I mean, there just was no tradition of cycling in these cities. And over the past 20 years, uh, they, uh, 30 years, actually, some of them, they have undertaken massive measures to encourage more cycling, make it more convenient and more accessible to more of the population. Uh, so-called for all ages and abilities. And you can see the three Canadian cities here. You've had, uh, the, I hope this is precious, though, those of you in Montreal, but you've had a quadrupling uh, in the percentage of, uh, by, of work commuters that get to work by bike. So you have roughly, I'll just say a quadrupling of cycling in Montreal over this 30-year uh, period. Oh, it's a 20-year period, I'm sorry. Uh, in Vancouver, uh, maybe it's a three or four-fold increase. In Toronto, it's about a a uh, threefold increase. So anyway, Montreal beats out Toronto. Does that make you feel good? <laughs> okay. And then on the right-hand side, you can see these are cities that in fact had uh, quite a tradition of, of cycling. Uh, not, not all. I mean, take Amsterdam and Copenhagen just for starters. I mean, everyone knows these are very, very cycling-oriented cities. They've had, they've had a history, a tradition, a culture of cycling. But even in those cities, I find it really, really impressive. They have huge increases. I mean, maybe not as a percent, but as an absolute increase, you have maybe a 10 or 15 percentage point increase in the bike share of all trips uh, in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Uh, and in Munich, uh, uh, you have um, something like a, maybe it's a third increase, 30% uh, or so increase. In Berlin, you have more than a doubling percentage uh, of trips by bike. So anyway, the point is that these cities, which are very large cities, uh, have experienced very large increases in cycling. That's the good news. So even in countries with low levels of cycling, we are making progress. So During the question. COVID pandemic, we were able to see some of that potential of cycling. Um, it's not part of the book, but we did an analysis recently on, on, on COVID and bicycling. This graph actually uses data based on a company, EcoCounter, who has their North American headquarters in Montreal. So maybe they are, they are watching uh, as well. What this graph does is it compares uh, cycling levels um, for various countries in 2020 and 2021 to 2019, the year before the COVID pandemic. Whenever cycling levels are above, um, the 2019 levels, we are above that line at zero, that teal colored uh, colored line. And then uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the weeks, the weeks of the year, first for 2020 compared to the weeks in 2019, and then 2021 compared to the weeks in 2019. What you see is that on average, most of the time, the lines are above the zero. So there was more cycling during the COVID pandemic than before. Uh, what you can also see is that steep declines, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, there were the words Spain and France are written on, on the graph. These were during lockdowns. There were pretty severe lockdowns, mainly in European countries. People were not allowed to leave their homes um, or could only leave their homes for specific purposes and had to write it on a paper and the police could check on you. So it's steep declines during these lockdowns, but then strong increases once the lockdowns were lifted. What you can also see is that the, the curves are sort of, the waves of the curves are sort of getting flatter in 2021 compared to in, in 2020. So the, the increase in cycling over 2019 levels um, is still there in 2021, but it's lower in many places than it was in, um, in 2020. Looking more detailed at this data, we came to the following conclusions. There were increasing or increases overall in cycling volumes and the cycling shares of, of trips. But as we already saw from that graph, there's a lot of variability by location, by purpose, by time of day, and by week and by month. In general, there were increases for exercise, recreational, cycling, getting outdoors, and relief from stress. And people actually state that in surveys when asked, why did you go cycling during COVID? Relief from stress and getting outdoors was a big, uh, was a big part. In general, also, there were increases in cycling in the afternoon and in the early evening in terms of time of day, uh, and uh, on weekends, uh, in particular Saturday and uh, and Sunday, if we look at type of facility, there were lar the largest increases were on off-road recreational paths as facilities. 
On the other hand, there were decreases in morning peak hour cycling, which makes a lot of sense because we were learning from home, we were working from home, we were doing everything from home, so we were not commuting uh, in the morning anymore. And so these are the trips that are not, not happening uh, anymore. And by the same token, there were decreases in utilitarian cycling. It's not only that people changed their travel behavior during COVID, but also cities changed how they accommodated cyclists during COVID. And sometimes there were specific measures in response to the COVID pandemic, and other times there were just like the one here in Paris, there was just a plan to make Rue de Rivoli a bicycle street, and it happened to coincide with the beginning of the pandemic, and it was hugely popular, and this was a road for cars before, and has now been turned in a road uh, for bicycles. You can see that on the side buses and some delivery vehicles can, can still get, get through, but very popular conversion to a cycling street. Paris, as you know, also dropped the overall speed limit on most streets to 30 kilometers per hour during that, um, that period. Now, in your own city, Montreal installed 68 kilometers of newer improved cycling facilities in 2020, and mostly to a very high standard, as you see here, with the bollards and with the, with the buffer uh, to, um, to, to, to the vehicles. And they feel so safe that entire families are, are cycling there. Some other photos on what happened uh, now from the United States. There's many cities implemented closed streets or shared streets. Closed streets are essentially streets that were closed for motor vehicle traffic and were given over to uh, pedestrians, cyclists, inline skaters. Shared streets are mainly residential streets where local traffic can still access or could still access, um, but they had to share with pedestrians and cyclists in that space. And on the upper left there in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you see these street eateries that we have there. You see that a two lane uh, motor, motor vehicle road was transformed in two way bicycle road with one car travel lane in the center. So again, more, more space for cyclists. And many of these impromptu measures got made permanent. This is an example here from Boylston Street in, in Boston, Massachusetts. So in July, 2020, you, there's no, no bike lane here. Uh, and then they put in a pop-up bike lane from July to October, which was very popular. It's very simple to do it. You just put up these, 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 these cones, these bollards to protect it from motor vehicle traffic because it was so popular, it was made permanent and is now a two-way cycle track that is, is very popular uh, in the city. Uh, sort of straight across from Montreal on the other side on the other coast, um, on the Pacific in Vancouver, they had a beach avenue where they put up these cones and opened it for cyclists. And they had over 10,000 cyclists on several days in the summer of 2020. And then they converted it with a concrete curb into a, uh, into a, 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 bicycle, a bicycle lane. And we just, just the other day, we learned from them. Now, they even have 14,000 cyclists on exactly that facility. So hugely popular. So during COVID, people changed their travel behavior towards cycling and cities changed towards accommodating cyclists more or better. We have an entire chapter in the book devoted to cycling in Latin American cities. And it was uh, co-authored by three uh, superb uh, colleagues of all professors of transportation or urban planning. Uh, and they did a wonderful job on this chapter. Unfortunately, Latin America in, in research, in transportation research in particular, uh, and urban planning tends to get neglected. And you know, there's almost 700 million people in Latin America. It's not a continent we should be neglecting. Um, so anyway, they did a great job looking at cycling in Latin America. Uh, they had some trouble because there are no national travel surveys in any of the Latin American countries. Uh, and so what they do it did instead is they relied on city surveys, which are somewhat different in design from one city to another. But one thing's for sure, looking out, you can see a huge variation in levels of cycling among these cities from virtually zero in some big cities, Valparaiso, Quito, in Ecuador, Lima, Peru, uh, and so forth, all the way up to 7%, 8% to, on the other side, in Bogota, Colombia, Guadalajara, uh, Mexico, Cali, and Rosario, uh, and so forth. And um, there's a reason, part, there's a good reason for this variation, uh, and that is the cities that are on the right-hand side, they're with high levels of cycling, have done a lot. They have invested massively in bicycling infrastructure. Uh, Bogota is one of the biggest examples. Within three or four years, Bogota came up with, uh, it was a network, I believe it's of 200 or more kilometers of completely separated, uh, protected bike bicycling facilities. Um, and actually, they, had, they actually hired uh, Dutch 
engineers and planners to create this system of uh, superb cycling infrastructure. And as a result, they had a big boom in, uh, in levels of cycling in Bogota, sort of the number one cycling city really in, in uh, uh, South America. Um, so anyway, the, what you're seeing here is, is not just differences in cycling, the differences result largely from differences in policies. And we also have an entire chapter uh, devoted to bicycling in China and in India, two really, really important countries in many respects, politically, economically, uh, and demographically, they account for uh, uh, roughly 3 billion people uh, in the world, which uh, it's almost half of all the people in the world. And um, a, little, a, bit, a bit of a sad story here. I, I wrote this chapter together with uh, three Chinese colleagues and one Indian colleague. Um, so all this information the, basically comes from them. Uh, they, they got it from original sources. So the, the sad story in China is that cycling has been decreasing uh, and in some cities dramatically decreasing. And even worse than that, it's decreasing more than this graph is showing because some cities, and this is also from city travel surveys. This is, there, again, there's no travel, national travel survey in, in, India, in China. And so it relies on city travel surveys, which differ in design from one city to another. So they're not entirely comparable. Uh, they do show the decline in cycling, but what's a little bit misleading is some of the cities include e-bikes in the bicycle category. Uh, and in most Chinese cities, roughly 90% or more of what we call e-bikes or pedelecs, um, really not bicycles at all. They, have, they don't even have pedals. They're basically uh, sit down electric scooters, uh, but they're categorized as e-bikes uh, by some of these cities. So the point is it, the decline shown in this graph is it's e even larger than what you see. Now it was important, why the decline? Why this huge decline in cycling in China over the last three decades? Number one, big increases in per capita income as a result of the tremendous growth in the Chinese economy. So big increases in per capita income leading to huge increases in car ownership and huge increases in car use. So that means the, the streets are full of cars. Uh, one of the government policy responses for most of this period was to reduce the roadway space devoted to cycling. So they either eliminated some cycling paths or made them narrower than they used to be. Uh, so where there was this uh, switch in the roadway space to cars instead of, of cyclists. Um, the other thing that happened is uh, because of the increased car use, uh, you also have more dangerous cycling. So you have more, more traffic on the streets. And that means if you're cycling on the streets, uh, it's, it's because we're dangerous. Uh, even worse, with all these cars and buses uh, on the streets, and also because of there's other kinds of air pollution, these are among the most polluted cities in the world, Chinese and Indian cities, always among the most polluted cities in the world, as I'm sure you, you, you know, which means cycling, as the air is getting more and more and more polluted, becomes actually dangerous just from a point of view of health and inhaling uh, deeply uh, these, these, the air pollution. Um, and there's other reasons. Good, well, one of the reasons, if I'm not saying it's a good reason, but uh, uh, because of the huge amount of money available to Chinese cities, there has been a huge investment, truly massive investment in public transport. Um, now, I think seven of the 10 largest metro systems in the world are currently in China. Incredibly. But anyway, that was not the case three decades ago. This massive investment in public transit, not just metro systems, they have bus rapid transit systems, they, they vastly improved their entire public transport network. And that is a kind of a competitor to cycling as well. And it's become even more of a competitor because as Chinese cities have been growing, it's not just in population, but also in area meaning you've got longer and longer trip distances. So as the trips get longer, you need public transit for those longer trips and less likely to cycle for those trips. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention here, and that is that in, or two more things actually, in China, there is virtually no gender gap. Uh, we'll mention this later in the presentation, but um, in the United States, and also in Canada, by the way, there is a big gender gap with many more men cycling than women, in China, it's 50-50. There's every bit as many women cycling as men cycling. And all of the cycling in China is utilitarian cycling. 
they, they don't cycle for exercise, for recreation, for the heck of it. They, they do it to get from point A to point B. Uh, one last thing, and then I'll go on to the next slide. I know Ralph wants me to keep out because I'm going on, but I'll just say one thing, and that is some, the, the central government in China and some of the local governments are now trying to turn around this decline in cycling, uh, but it's going to take a long, long time. In, in India, uh, again, a very large country, um, we have roughly a fifth of all trips are made by bike. It might surprise you that we have a higher share in rural areas than in urban areas. 18% in urban areas, 20%, 22% rather, in rural areas. Um, the reason for that is much shorter trip distance as rural areas. We're talking about villages, fairly compact villages with almost no public transport. Uh, and short trip distances. So that's why you have the high level of cycling there uh, and a somewhat lower percentage in urban areas because you have more public transport and, and uh, uh, longer trip distances depending on the size of the city. One thing that's interesting is the percentage of trips by bike uh, remains about 20%. There's almost no change at all uh, in those lower four size categories all the way from 100,000 to 2 million. It's all roughly 20, 21%. Then as the size category gets larger, so two to 5 million, it falls to 16%. As it, as it gets 5 billion plus, it's 9%. And the reasons are rather similar to what I was sort of referring to before for China. And that is the larger the city, the better the public transport system it has, and the more public transport it has, the longer the trip distances, and also the highest incomes of parts of the population are in the largest cities, more likely to afford cars uh, and to use cars instead of commuting to work by bike. Oh, and oh, one last thing, there's a huge gender gap uh, in India, huge. I mean, it's, I think it's five or six times uh, as many men cycle as women. There's uh, sort of all sorts of cultural reasons for this, but uh, there is a huge gender gap. That's a big problem in India. And the gender gap also exists in the, the countries we are displaying in, in this graph, where in Australia, the UK, the US, and Canada, only about a quarter to a third of all bike trips are made by women. And that, of course, compares at the other end to Japan, the Netherlands, and Denmark, where more than 50% of all bike trips are made, uh, are made by women. And the other countries, Austria, Germany, and, and Sweden, are, are in between. Uh, this shows you cyclists in uh, in Denmark and in the uh, in the Netherlands, and you see that many women women are riding are riding bicycles in those two countries. We can of course also uh, cycle at all ages. We can cycle from a very young age. Uh, we may need a tricycle for that or a balanced bike, uh, and we can cycle into older age. We may also need uh, a bicycle with three wheels again there, as we see at the at the lower center of the. Um, of, of the slide, but then they can also help us uh, transport um, various various things because also, of course, ride for different trip purposes for utilitarian purposes or for leisure purposes as the people on the on the lower right who are going for for, for, for a bike ride for for exercise and, and recreation. This graph here shows you the share of cycling by age group as we look across the different countries, we see that. The highest share of trips by bike is always made by those in the youngest age category. These are the individuals that are not at driving age yet. They cannot have a driver's license. If we then look to the left, to the US and the UK, they're at a much lower level, we notice that. But then if we see the increasing age there, uh, bicycling drops uh, as, as people get older to less than 1% uh, of trips. We look on the right hand side, Japan, Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands, we see that initial drop from the youngest age group to the older age groups. But then, for example, in Japan and in Germany, cycling stays stable across the different age groups. It declines somewhat in Denmark, but still has 10% of all trips by those 70 years and older are made by bicycle. And then, of course, on the all the way on the right hand side, we have the Netherlands, where about one quarter of all trips by those 70 years and older are made by bicycle. So it shows us we can continue riding a bike into older age if the conditions are right. And we talk later in this talk about why, what these conditions um, are. A very important trend also related to cycling of, of seniors uh, are e-bikes and the sales of e-bikes. This shows you the trend in various countries up to 2018. If we extended that graph through the COVID pandemic, we would have a very steep increase in the sale of, of e-bikes. Most of the e-bikes here, not all, are uh, pedelecs. Pedelecs are e-bikes where you get electric support 
when you pedal. If you don't pedal, you don't get the electric support. Some of them may be the, the ones that John mentioned, like in China where you just have a throttle, but that's the, the minority of, of bikes in this, uh, in, in this graph. They typically come in, in different classes. There's one group of, of, of pedal legs that goes up to 28 miles per hour, I think 45 kilometers per hour. The other one is limited at 30 kilometers per hour or around 20, 20 miles per hour. Uh, but their sales has and their use has increased um, a lot. Making cycling safer is probably the single most important way to get more people on bikes. And it's especially important for the young, for the old, for anyone with disabilities, and, and for anyone who's timid or risk averse, like, like I am. Um, it turns out various studies show that women, uh, for whatever reasons, are more sensitive to safety and cycling than men are. And that might explain why you have uh, this gender gap in countries where cycling is not, not as safe, such as the United States and Australia and, and Canada and the UK. Um, and I think that safety uh, of cycling, much, and you will show it, so I'll show you just a few minutes. Uh, the safety of cycling, the much higher safety of cycling in the Netherlands, Denmark, and Germany, I think does a lot, it goes a long ways toward explaining why there's much higher levels of cycling there. And you can see the relationship right here. It's stunning. <laughs> And this is not, it's, it does, it's, it's, it's a correlation. We can't prove causation, but it's quite likely. Uh, and it goes in both directions. So first of all, you see the United States in the corner of shame. Uh, we not only have the least cycling in this graph, we also have the most dangerous cycling. Uh, and then in the corner of praise, I suppose we have the Netherlands, the most cycling and the safest cycling. And you can see most of the countries uh, sort of fit along this graph. So. Uh, it go, when I say it goes in both directions, uh, first of all, if you make cycling safer, you're going to encourage more cycling. So that's the direction in one of that. That was cycling safety, encouraging more cycling. But it turns out there's another direction to that effect, uh, that effect and that is uh, a, something that's called safety in numbers. The more cycling you have, or the higher the rates of cycling, the safer it becomes. Why would this be? Well, for one thing, uh, as there are more cyclists on the road, they become more visible and expected by motorists. Um, they become also, they have more public support and political support uh, and are more likely to support political measures or to improve cycling infrastructure and also to implement laws that are more favorable to cyclists, such as, for example, in Northern Europe, um, by law, if a motorist hits a cyclist or a pedestrian, it is by law the responsibility of the motorist unless you can prove that the cyclist or pedestrian deliberately caused the crash, and that is almost impossible. Um, at any rate, there's another reason uh, as well, and, and that is that, uh, for take the Netherlands, for example, virtually every Dutch is also a cyclist. <laughs> So they, Dutch motorists don't view cyclists as these people from outer space that they have nothing to do with and, you know, foreign people. Uh, they're as much of cyclists, uh, whether behind the wheel of a car or on a bike. And so they're much more likely to be sensitive to the needs of cyclists and, and sensitive to, the, to avoiding endangering cyclists. Whereas in the United States, where uh, most motorists are not cyclists, only a small percentage are. And as a result, most motorists just don't respect the needs of cyclists. So anyway, that's the effect uh, of, of safety in numbers. Now, here you get to, to be glad that you're Canadian if you're up there in Canada. Not everyone is, I've just seen people coming in from other places as well. But uh, Canada does a much, much better job in terms of cycling safety as well as walking safety than the United States. So this graph, and we especially inserted this uh, for this talk, uh, as you can see, uh, Canada is sort of on the upper end there. If you look at the sort of group more with the European countries, obviously, um, that uh, Canada has been successful in greatly reducing per capita uh, cyclist fatalities and pedestrian fatalities, uh, especially compared to the United States. Uh, it's like twice as successful uh, in, in improving cycling and and walking safety than the United States has been. You can see we're way up there. We've made very little progress. We had been making slight progress up until that period, 2010, 2013. Then uh, since about 2012 or so, 2010, um, we've had big increases in cyclist 
fatalities as well as pedestrian fatalities in the United States. It's absolutely shocking. And it's, this is not a sort of a statistical artifact because of the way we calculated it. Whether you look at it per kilometer walked or bicycle per capita, total levels or any way you want to, uh, cycling and walking have become much more dangerous over the past 10 years in the United States. I'll explain to you why later. And this is where I'm gonna explain it to you. But first, let's look at the graph. This now looks at it not per capita, but per 100 million kilometers cycled. And this is now just cycling, not walking. Uh, but you can see, um, first of all, that the four European countries are much, much safer in terms of cycling than the United States. This is per mile or per kilometer, per 100 million kilometers cycled. Uh, and that is not only is it lower, but it's been getting much better in these other countries. So look at the UK. Uh, you have about a, a tripling in cycling safety. Another way to look at it, it's a third, roughly a third, the level of cyclist fatalities per 100 million kilometers as you had in the first period. So roughly a tripling in cycling safety. In Germany, a doubling in cycling safety. Denmark, more than a doubling in cycling safety. In the Netherlands, maybe it's 60% or so uh, improvement in cycling safety. In all those cases, big declines in fatality rates per 100 uh, kilometers uh, cycled. In the United States, we had some progress, I mean, actually quite a bit, going from 7.2 to 4.5 in that middle period. And then all of a sudden, in this last period, as shown in the per capita data, all of a sudden this big increase, 4.5 to 6. Why? <laughs> well, there's unfortunately too many reasons. Uh, number one, uh, vehicle miles traveled have increased. So, and when I say vehicles, motor vehicle miles traveled have increased a lot in the United States, partly due to not right, low gas prices. Um, and the more cars you've got and trucks that uh, you've got on the road, the more dangerous it's gonna be for pedestrians and cyclists is because you're more likely to, to be run into by. Uh, um, and you also have larger vehicles. In the United States these days, it's almost 80 of all new personal vehicle sales are truck, light trucks of some sort. Uh, example, a minivan, uh, a pickup truck, uh, or an SUV. And by the way, pickup trucks, as you probably know, this is probably true in Canada as well. These are not little pickup trucks. These are like mega muscle uh, pickup trucks uh, that are very high and wide. And many, many studies, as the larger the size of the vehicle, the more of a danger it poses for a pedestrian and also for a cyclist. So that's another reason this huge surge in um, light trucks, uh, instead of having a sedan, having a light truck for a personal vehicle. Another reason, uh, in the United States, there's been a big increase in drunk driving. I think in, in the British call it drink driving, but we call it drunk driving. Um, and, and that's in spite of us having a higher allowable legal level of, of alcohol in the blood. We still, the rate of drunk driving has increased, and we have an epidemic, truly an epidemic of distracted driving. People texting while driving, using cell phones while driving, and dashboards of cars that are so complicated, they're like cock cockpits of a plane. It's unbelievable how complicated they become. But the texting, and, and, and even though many states and many cities in the United States have laws prohibiting texting while driving and prohibiting handheld cell phone use while driving, uh, the police do not enforce it. Nowhere do the police enforce this. And so you have an increase in distracted driving. That's a problem as well. Motorists not really even paying attention to what's going on on the roadway, let alone paying attention to uh, a, a, avoiding the endangerment of pedestrians uh, and cyclists. I'm thinking of one more reason. What's, Ralph, what's the reason I'm forgetting here? Um, I think there it's, is another okay. one. We, ha we have to move on anyways. Okay, okay. <laughs> I guess that's enough reasons. Okay, we have a whole chapter on New York, London, and Paris. Uh, and I had a French co-author of this chapter and, and also a, a British co-author. And what you see here is some great success uh, in increasing cycling in, the, in these three cities, none of which had a big tradition of cycling at all. I mean, they had no history or culture of cycling. Um, they really relied instead on public transit and walking. And that was it. That's how people got around in these cities. Well, they decided they were going to invest in cycling infrastructure and try to encourage cycling. 
and they were quite successful. You have more than a tripling of cycling in New York. This is a percentage of all trips for all trip purposes. You have more than a tripling in New York. You have a doubling in London. In Paris, it's the winner, 12-fold increase in Paris. And it really is, has been a humongous increase because they have done many, many things, uh, both car restrictive measures and also uh, promoting cycling. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that cycling has increased is that cycling has been made much safer in these cities, uh, both in terms of fatality rates, uh, so number of fatalities relative to the amount of cycling, and also serious injury rates. You can see for New York, London, and Paris, without a single exception, cycling has become safer, both in terms of reduced fatality rates and reduced serious injury rates. Uh, but overall, Paris is the winner. It has by far the lowest fatality rates and the lowest serious injury rates of any of these cities. Uh, and this is one of the ways they did it. Uh, it's the, the emphasis in terms of infrastructure in all three of these cities is now protected bike lanes. Sometimes, some people call them cycle tracks, uh, but as you, they're physically separated from motor vehicle traffic. And that's crucial because over 95% of cyclist fatalities are the result of crashes with motor vehicles. So you need to keep motor vehicles out of the way of cyclists. And that's what this does. As you can see, um, that you have a really complete physical separation of the cyclists from the motor vehicle traffic. What's also very important, and it's increasingly done in, in these cities and other cities, at intersections. If you look at the case of New York here, you can see there are special traffic signals to pre prevent motorists from making left-hand turns, or in some cases, right-hand turns, into cyclists going straight ahead. That is really important. And many cities around the world are now, they're not just building uh, protected bike lanes, but also protected intersections. And that's important. So what can be done to encourage more cycling and improving its, its safety? And John already started talking about the better cycling facilities, and we'll talk about that uh, some more. Another element, of course, is traffic calming in residential neighborhoods where you reduce the speed of motor vehicles so that bicyclists can share with lower speed and low volumes of motorized traffic. Mixed use zoning and improved urban design to keep trip distances short enough to make them bikeable. Integrating bicycling with public transportation for the first mile, last mile component of longer distance trips. Restrictions on motor vehicle use, that's the speed and the volume of motor vehicles and parking, uh, et cetera. Uh, improved traffic education for motorists to uh, avoid hitting cyclists and pedestrians. And of course, traffic education for cyclists about the rules of the road. Traffic regulations and enforcement in particular for, for motorists. And John already talked about speed limit enforcement and other things like that. And then of course, uh, special events and promotional uh, campaigns. A better bike infrastructure uh, increases safety and goes in hand with, with increased cycling levels. And John already talked about this, but here we see it again. This shows you the increase in the mileage or in the kilometers of cycling facilities in about 20 cities over a period of uh, 20 to 30 years. And all of these cities have seen increases in cycling. There's quite some variability here, mainly because the cities started at different levels of bike infrastructure and different levels of cycling. However, what they all have in common is that they all reduced the fatality and severe injury rates relative to cycling levels. So cycling got safer per bike trip or per kilometer cycle in all of these cities. One key element implemented were uh, protected bike lanes, also called cycle tracks, this shows you the trend in the United States, um, about a 16-fold increase between 2006 and, uh, and 2020, and the growth is still uh, continuing. In order for this to happen, importantly, uh, rules and regulations had to change. Uh, when I came to the United States in the early 2000s, we had an AASHTO, that's the State Highway Transportation Official, the AASHTO Bikeway Guide that uh, was against cycle tracks. We had an Ashto bikeway guide that was against any bicycling facilities at intersections. I couldn't believe it, but looking at their, at their guide at the time, it said, well, 20 yards before an intersection, the bike lane should end and the bike lane should begin 20 yards after the intersection and in between, it's, it's good luck. That was, that was the official approach in the United States. Now, this got challenged by NACTO. These are the city transportation officials who put together their own guide, very much inspired by the Crow guide in the Netherlands more and more cities started using it. And then finally in 2013, the US Department of Transportation said, 
uh, engineers can use or designers can use the NACTO or the AASHTO guide. And of course, AASHTO has improved since then and has started changing its guide to catch up with the, uh, with the times and with the, the cutting edge of, of, of research. What also had to change was funding. This shows you the increase in federal funding in the US for pedestrian and bicycle projects, starting with ICE-T, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991, which was sort of a, a landmark law that sort of started focusing on other modes than just the automobile. And you see how it's gone up since then. You have a big um, peak uh, in there. These are the uh, recovery and reinvestment funds uh, in response to the big economic crisis in 2008, uh, 2009. We had slight reductions under MAP 21, um, federal law, but we have seen increases throughout this period. And the new, um, the new uh, act that was recently passed also promises even more uh, increasing funding for bicycling. What do these cycle tracks uh, look like? You know the lower left there in Montreal. You have the, the concrete uh, barrier or curb that separates the cyclists or protects them uh, from the motor vehicles. On the upper left, you see how they do it in Copenhagen. If you look at the center of the picture in the back, you see there's this little curb that separates motor vehicles from cyclists, and there will be another curb separating the cyclists from the pedestrians. In Bogota, in Colombia, on the right, you have these caps. Sometimes they're called armadillos. In my area here in Washington, DC, they're often black with white stripes, so people call them little zebras. So there are different names for them, but they're designed to protect the cyclists from the motor vehicles. In the lower right, you have in Seville, Spain, where they built a, a fence to protect the cyclists from the from the motorists. An example here from Toronto, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, on the one hand of this, of, the, uh, of this roadway here, you have a raised bike lane, which is a little bit like a, like a cycle track, um, separated from motor vehicle traffic. On the other side, however, you have a, a conventional uh, bike lane going in that direction. Another example, this time from Chicago, one of the busiest, Milwaukee Avenue, busiest bike lanes in, in Chicago. And you see the protecting concrete barriers there protecting the cyclists from the motor vehicle traffic. Now, preparing for this talk, Ahmed mentioned something about you having a lot of snow. And of course, we had to bring this in. Um, maintenance is very, very important for, uh, for bicycling infrastructure. Um, these are pictures from Quebec City, which is even colder and snowier than you are in Montreal, at least as far as I understand it. And from Minneapolis, St. Paul, a very cold area here in the United States. And you see how they maintain their bikeways in the winter to keep them open and keep them ready for uh, for cyclists. Uh, while researching the book, we found one new type uh, of infrastructure or type of measure um, called bicycle expressways. They are often um, connecting the hinterlands with the cities. Some of them are also in cities. And the idea is to have a, a separated path for motor vehicle traffic, but also separate cyclists from pedestrians, and then have a, a smooth connection. What that means is Whenever there is a, these uh, bicycle expressways are crossing roadways, you either have a tunnel or you have a bridge. And that does two things. First, it avoids crashes because cyclists are not interfering with traffic. And second, it speeds up cycling because you're not waiting at the traffic lights to cross the, the intersections. And they are, they are now carried um, from the hinterlands to the city and also through, uh, through cities. In the center bottom there, you see one of these initiatives that John alluded to in China, where they try to bring back uh, bicycling and promote bicycling again. This is an elevated um, bicycle expressway in Beijing, China, that's above the city, sort of giving cyclists uh, a free, a smooth ride. Of course, here in North America, we have some of these similar trails, like on the left here, the Cherry Creek Trail in Denver has some stretches where pedestrians and cyclists are separated. The Midtown Greenway in Minneapolis on the upper right has uh, the separation with the pedestrians being to the right of that uh, white, white line there, but it's much more common to have the mixed operation we see there on the Minuteman Trail in Boston with pedestrians and cyclists in the, in the same space. Overall, trails have been increasing uh, in the US in, in terms of supply. This is from the Rails to Trails Conservancy, showing their, showing their huge increase, like a 12-fold increase in trail mileage in, on, on rail trails in the United States since the, since the 1990s, so many more trails that are available. Um, there are also many more trails available in urban areas. This is the Lakefront Trail in, in Chicago. You see the, the nice separation of pedestrians and cyclists. It's very popular for recreational rides, but it's also popular for commutes. You see the downtown right in the background there. So many commuters are using the same uh, facility. 
Very important for the Indies facilities are bridges or flyovers because uh, big roadways or rivers uh, can pose a big challenge for cyclists because there's no way to cross. Even if there is a motor vehicle bridge, uh, but there, if there's no bicycling facility on it, cyclists are very hesitant to cross it because once you're on the bridge, a lot of moving motor vehicles, there's nowhere you can go if there is a close crash because they're concrete barriers on the side of the bridge. So cyclists don't like that. So providing bridges or the, like this flyover here to connect over rivers or connect over, in this case, a, a busy intersection are very, very important. Another trend we found are um, sort of the import of protected intersections to North America. This is a Dutch style intersection uh, seen from a Google, a Google uh, satellite shot in Salt Lake City. And the way these protected intersection works is mainly via these safety islands. And what they do is the following. Let's say a motor vehicle comes there from the right, wants to make a right-hand turn. The safety island forces the motor vehicle to travel further into the intersection and then make that right-hand turn. That does two things. On the one hand, it um, forces the motorists to make a slower turn. If that safety island wouldn't be there, they would, they would try to really go very fast uh, around that corner, but they can't do that. Second, while traveling out in the intersection, they're much more likely to see a cyclist who is coming from this side. And then when they both can see each other, they're able to avoid any conflict uh, at, the, at the intersection uh, there. In addition, uh, because they're slower, they're also more likely to avoid a conflict. If there is a crash, it's going to be at lower speed and of less impact. In addition for the cyclist, the crossing distance, the exposure to the motor vehicles is shorter. Uh, then without these safety islands. And of course, on the other side, they can continue straight, but they can start queuing and make a two-stage uh, left turn. Um, these intersections look different in different places. This is one from Austin, where they have 32. No, they're not fully protected. They may only just have um, one part of those intersections that are protected with the same, the same idea. If you're building these facilities, uh, over time, you'll finally get to a network. And this is a network of bike paths and lanes in Amsterdam. If you look closely, you notice a difference between red and orange. Red is the existing network, orange is the planned network. So the truly connected network throughout the city. On top of that, you have traffic calm neighborhood streets between these, the, 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 the red and orange lines here, where cyclists share the roadway with motorists at lower speeds and low car travel volumes. And keep in mind, Amsterdam is not the best cycling city in the Netherlands. Uh, many Dutch people are actually tell you that Amsterdam is quite bad, and there are many better, better cities for cycling. Uh, but it's quite impressive looking from here from, from North America. Also keep in mind that Amsterdam did the same thing that most North American Western European cities did uh, in the 60s and 70s. They accommodated the car. You will see the same street on the left and on the right. In 1971, the car is the mode of the future. You see some bikes there, but they're sort of pushed to the side fairly narrow sidewalks. The cars are even parking on the sidewalks. Clearly the car is, is king in this picture. You also see the bad, the bad air quality uh, in, in that picture. Now we go to the right-hand side in, in 2020, cars are banned from this street. It's a bicycle street. You have wider sidewalks, you have space for cyclists, you have space for pedestrians, and you have a much higher quality of life and nicer, uh, nicer space here. Bike networks, of course, have to grow over time. And we have two examples here, also from our book, written by two local experts from uh, Portland and from Seville in Spain. On the top, we have Portland, Oregon. Um, and with the bikeway network there in 1990, the black lines, you see the couple of lines there. In the background, that color will also change in that map and it will get uh, red and then brown. And the more red and brown it gets, um, the higher the bike level is in that census track. On the lower side, we have Seville in Spain and in green, the bikeways they had in 2005. Advancing 10 years on the top here in Portland, you see how much the bikeway network has grown and how much the colors have changed towards orange and red, how much the cycling levels have grown. In Seville at the bottom, in only three years, a new government coming in being really committed to bicycling, you see how much their bike network grew in only three years. Advancing another 15 years on the top in Portland, you see how their bike network has grown even more and how bicycling commute levels have gotten much, much higher. Another 10 years at the bottom in Seville, you can see how their bikeway network is getting tighter and better, better integrated. 
Well, traffic calming of residential neighborhoods is something that's often neglected. Uh, it, uh, in addition to building separate bicycle infrastructure, it's absolutely crucial to reduce speed limits in residential neighborhoods. And uh, this is exactly what happens in many, many European cities. Uh, and they do it because speed kills, as the, this says. Um, the, the likelihood of a motor vehicle killing a pedestrian increases exponentially uh, as the speed of the motor vehicle increases. Roughly the same thing applies to cyclists as well, uh, but the graphs have been created by the World Health Organization uh, for pedestrians. But you can see, I mean, really it is exponential. It's like at 30 kilometers an hour, there's about a 10% chance of being killed. Uh, and then when you get to 50 kilometers an hour, it's about 85%. So it really is dramatic. And it says you really need to reduce the speed limit, the allowable speed of motor vehicles in order to increase the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. And one way to do that is not just posting a lower speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour, but also reinforcing that with infrastructure measures, roadway modifications, uh, roadway narrowing, zigzag routing, something talked about called chicanes, raised intersections and crosswalks, traffic circles, speed humps and bumps. Many of you are familiar with these sorts of things. Mid-block closures, artificial dead ends, bulb outs at intersections. Let's look, let's look at some examples uh, of these traffic calming measures. This is a very typical case in, in Germany. Uh, I would say most, maybe 70% of uh, urban streets um, in Germany are in fact traffic calm like this, and it's the same in the Netherlands. Uh, you have, first of all, posted here, the 30 kilometer per hour speed limit. What's important is it's not just one street here, one street there. It's like a zone. It's an entire neighborhood. So you, motorists cannot avoid this particular street by, and then just instead speed on the adjacent residential street. This is area wide and it's coordinated and integrated so uh, you don't get this uh, unnecessary uh, motor vehicle traffic. You can see one of the measures used is road narrowing, especially in the entry to this street. This used to be a, a four lane road and now they turned it into, it's about a one and a half lane road, if think of that. Um, and they deliberately do this at both ends. They have the signage uh, and it's also very strictly enforced. Uh, and on such streets, incidentally, in most German cities, cyclists are allowed, as you can see here, cyclists are allowed to go in both directions, whereas cars are only allowed to go in one direction. It varies. It's not on all streets, but on many, many Dutch and German streets. Um, the other thing you can do is make through traffic impossible uh, to a residential neighborhood. And here is, we have two examples from Canada, uh, Montreal and Quebec City. And you can see it's, there are cut-throughs here for cyclists and obviously for pedestrians as well, but motor vehicles can't get through. So you're keeping out that through traffic, which doesn't belong in residential neighborhoods anyway, and you're making things safer for pedestrians and cyclists, and you're also clean, keeping the air cleaner, it's less noisy and so forth. Here's an example of something similar. This is Melbourne, Australia. Uh, clearly, this was before this barrier was put in there, it was simply a through street and there was a lot of few traffic through this residential neighborhood. Well, you know, there, were, there were pedestrian and cyclist fatalities and they ended up putting at this installation and now you have cut throughs for pedestrians and cyclists and it's a dead end for cars. Great way to keep out through traffic. Uh, this is, uh, you might wonder, well, what's special about this slide? Well, what's special is that nothing is special. <laughs> that is, there's no special infrastructure. This is a so-called play street. This is what they call it in German, Spielstrasse. And you can see from the sign, this is a completely shared street. The speed limit is officially seven kilometers per hour. Uh, cyclists, pedestrians, and playing children have equal rights to use this street. And it is the responsibility by law of the motorist to avoid hitting a motorist, I'm oh, sorry, hitting a cyclist, a pedestrian, or a child playing in the street. Uh, and that law is really, really enforced. So here with no, even with no special infrastructure, you've really done a great job of making this a more walkable, more bikeable and playable neighborhood. Uh, this is an example from Chicago, uh, something, a, a trend that is, I'm not sure if it's so much in uh, Canadian cities, but in American cities, a lot of American cities are introducing something called uh, greenways, they're urban greenways. Um, and you can see here, in this case, there is some special infrastructure. You have a contraflow bike lane here, 
In the other direction, it's a sh you can't quite see it very well, but it, there's a share road or shared lane uh, shared by motorists and cyclists uh, in the other direction. And you have the speed limit, which is really important of 20 miles an hour, which is 30 kilometers an hour. This is the, and if this street is parallel to a main arterial street, so it's a great alternative for cyclists to take instead of trying to ride on the arterial street. It makes it safer and more pleasant for everyone and, and for the neighborhood. Another two other important policies to promote uh, bicycling are integration with public transport and bike parking. And that's what we see on this, on this graph here. Bike transit integration is typically done in two ways. One is to allow bike parking at train stations, as we see here at Union Station in DC on the top or at Freiburg and Groningen main stations uh, in the center of the, of the graph. It's bike parking garages at, at train stations. The second element is allowing bicycles on vehicles. So the upper right, we see an example from Minneapolis where there are bike racks on buses and something like 80 or even 85% of all buses in the US now have these, these bike racks. And then the example on the left from Vancouver also exists where they allow to bring bicycles on rail vehicles. That's often restricted to certain cars, uh, certain hours, often the, the off peak of the day. Uh, parking is of course also important at work, but also throughout the city as we see there in Portland, this bike parking career that was put in instead of two parked cars, you can park 20 bicycles or so. On the lower right, we have a bike parking machine or bike parking robot from Nagoya where your bike is entered and either goes up or it goes down, it's parked by the machine and you can retrieve it on a, with, with a code on a screen, it comes out in a, in a minute, in a minute or so. There are of course, many, many other measures that we don't have time to go, go into, but I want to quickly touch on some of them. One is Ciclovias, an idea that comes out of Latin America. This is when we close streets for motorized traffic for hour, some hours, for a day, for a weekend, for a week, for a month, for a summer, to sort of give people the idea of what this space would be like if we could use it for walking, cycling, inline skating, and all these other things. Uh, but not for, for moving and storing uh, motor vehicles. Bike sharing has been very successful in attracting different uh, cycling users, especially those that don't wanna worry about theft, that don't wanna worry about maintenance, that don't have place or space to store the bicycle. Um, many, many campaigns can be run by employers uh, or work related like Bike to Work Day that happens in Canada and the US uh, once a year. The idea is that um, employees have a good experience riding the bike and have a, ride the bike uh, to work uh, more often. There are many other programs that employers can, can run. Bike to school days, of course, exist as well to get children to ride their bikes to, uh, to school. Training is important. In uh, Germany and uh, Denmark and the Netherlands, school children get training in bicycling uh, in uh, elementary schools or so between third and fourth grade. They learn in the classroom and then they learn in traffic gardens outside of the school and then in the end, um, sometimes, not always, the police even take them out into the real world to ride on real facilities. Um, in the US, that exists as well, but it's mainly voluntary. There are some cities um, that, that, uh, that require it, like Washington, DC. Bike training for adults is very important, especially in countries with low cycling levels. Many adults may not have ridden a bike anymore, uh, and a bike since they were children, and they want to get back into cycling and they want to feel comfortable, and so offering training courses for them is important. A very, very big one is training motorists. Training motorists when they get their driver's license, how to behave around cyclists and pedestrians and how to avoid hitting them. That includes many things, but for example, looking over your right-hand shoulder before making a right-hand turn, looking over your left-hand shoulder before opening the car door to avoid something that's called dooring. And there are many other things, but training motorists is very, very important. And then last, many cities are copying what the city of Copenhagen started, which is what they call their bicycle account. So every two years, they do a survey of cyclists and they ask questions about the conditions of bikeways, of things they want to see improved, uh, about the bike climate, uh, etc. And they also take stock of uh, data they have in the city on bikeway length, bikeway conditions, uh, tra safety trends, etc. And then they're using that data um, to formulate policy and set goals for the future. And then they can always look back on how they achieved those goals uh, two years, uh, two years end. Hey, hey, Kevin, just one, one thing, Ralph. Hey, given the, the timing uh, of this particular lecture, if you can go back one slide, you've got the upper left. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday. So there's the, the Easter bunny for you. Okay, uh, now, uh, Ralph, you might have to leave. And if you have to, that's okay. Oh, wait, I need to then take over or oh, whatever. Uh, implementation strategies. Implementation is crucial. 
uh, you can have the best ideas in the world, the best plans, the best engineering designs. If you cannot implement them, they are useless. So we have devoted two entire chapters of the book, in fact, to implementation. Uh, how exactly do you do this? Uh, and we have one chapter on Sevilla and, and Portland showing specifically how it was in those cities, but we also have an entire chapter on implementation. Um, one, you need to publicize both the individual and societal benefits. You have to ensure citizen participation in all stages of planning and implementation. If you have a controversial policy, implement it in stages. Uh, see how it works, and if it's successful, then expand it. This has happened with traffic calming, for example, in almost every city where it's been introduced. Develop long-range plans, regularly update them, gives you a guidance uh, over time. You need to combine incentives uh, for cycling with Dittus incentives for car use, and I would say that one of our biggest problems, I think the single biggest problem in North America, Canada, and the United States, and also Australia, by the way, is we don't have enough disincentives for car use. We are so hesitant to impose restrictions on parking or raising parking prices uh, uh, or reducing car speeds or making car-free zones and so forth. And that's where European cities are really way ahead of us. And, and we need to focus more on, on implementing those disincentives. To get things implemented, you do need to build alliances with politicians, sustainability advocates, a whole group, various kinds of environmental, uh, urban advocates, cycling advocates, pedestrian advocates, public transport advocates, getting together have more power to, uh, to, to implement change. Uh, national, state, local bike advocates is absolutely crucial and Ralph already mentioned benchmarking uh, over time. Now, two main, uh, the lab, we're almost finished, almost two, only two more slides. Uh, so we have made progress, that's sort of the good news. There's sort of a good news slide, a bad news slide. The good news slide is, we have made many cities here in, in North America and Australia and Europe have made a huge amount of progress uh, over the last three decades since about 1990. Big expansion, huge improvement in cycling facility design as well. Big increase in federal funding here in the United States. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Canada also now has federal funding for walking and cycling policies, which it didn't used to have. Um, also, in, in, in both the United States and in Canada, and certainly already in Europe, you have much more integration of cycling into transportation planning at all government levels, national, state, or provincial, and, and also local levels. That's really important. It's not something sort of separate off to itself that's sort of incidental or marginal. It's part of your overall transportation planning. Uh, and also now we have a really large cadre of well-trained cycling engineers and planners uh, in government and in consulting. So there are trained professionals who are ready out there to build this particular infrastructure uh, to promote cycling. Uh, you might not think this last one's important, but those of you at McGill maybe do, um, that we've had an exponential growth, truly exponential growth in academic research and publications promoting and guiding bike improvements. And why do you think it's important? Even though it's academic, that doesn't mean it's irrelevant. It means that advocates, public policymakers um, can use, can cite this academic research as evidence of the benefits of promoting more cycling. Benefit of the physical, maybe it's physical activity, health benefits, environmental benefits, energy benefits, and so forth. And all of this has been enabled by a really great coalition. This is where it gets to the last point for implementation, a coalition of by public health, academic, uh, environmental city planning and sustainability advocates. Now the big butt comes, <laughs> but much more needs to be done, much, much more, especially in North America uh, and Australia. Um, we uh, need much more investment in infrastructure and programs to encourage more cycling. And especially that's true uh, to encourage more, more children or adolescents and, and more, more women to cycle uh, and also uh, older adults. Um, and the, the, we, we've seen that these protected cycling facilities have been very successful at encouraging more cycling and also more cycling, by the way, among women and children and, and older adults. Uh, so we need much, much more of that. Second is crucial need to improve cycling safety. Uh, one of those is enforcement. I mean, in the United States, there's just almost no enforcement of any of the laws to protect cyclists. 
It's just not done. Motorists get, I'm sorry to say this, but it's true. Motorists get away with murder. It just is true. Well, murder maybe is an exaggeration, but anyway, negligent homicide in many, many cases. Uh, they're doing things that are just outright dangerous, especially for pedestrians and cyclists. We need more protected bike lanes and intersections. We have need a big expansion of off-road greenways and trails. Um, we need traffic safety training in schools as well, just mentioned. And we need crucially the inclusion of head bike safety uh, in driver license training and testing. I can tell you, I got my driver's license in North Carolina and I don't think there was even one single question about how I should be driving to avoid endangering uh, pedestrians or cyclists. Um, and that just has to change. We need not only to, to train motorists to really respect the rights of cyclists, um, and then those rights need to be enforced with real police enforcement. Okie dokie, folks, if you're interested in more details, you might consider uh, looking at a copy of the book. Um, it's it's uh, readily available. <laughs> okay, folks. I think we are ready to take questions now, but I have to, I think Ralph has to leave. So I have to do something. Now, someone has to tell Ralph or Ahmed or- Yeah, uh, we, we, we are here. Uh, okay. So thank you so much for a very inspiring and enthusiastic talk. And, and it's really, really uh, a big meal. The book is amazing, actually. Uh, for those of, uh, who are listening to us online or haven't read the book, I read the book. And I've been assigning it to students to read in my classes. So it's, 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 there's a lot of people have been waiting for that book to come out. And I know you have been working on it for a long time to get it out to that quality, that this is like one of the best books that you can use to assign to students to read, to learn about cycling and active transport, actually. So uh, I'm honest, but I, I, I admit that. And I'm, but I have to say it's excellent. Uh, it's an excellent book and the talk is amazing and, and you got us really excited. So- Well, uh, I, I can only say one thing, Ahmed, you're 100% correct. <laughs> yeah. You have very good taste. <laughs> okay, so yeah. let I- uh, Ahmed, let me interrupt very quickly. I, I have to apologize, I have to go. I have to teach a class in nine minutes. Okay. And it's about um, pedestrians and traffic calming. So I can just continue this, this lecture into the classroom. So thanks to you for hosting this. Thanks to everyone for coming and good luck to John with the question. <laughs> John, John, I think he's capable. <laughs> I sure hope so. I, I've seen some of the questions popping up and I'm thinking, hmm, how am I going to answer that one? Okay. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Ralph. Much appreciated Goodbye, Ralph. for squeezing us between, like, between you and your, and your very busy schedule. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. And I'll send you some of the questions after that uh, we got. Okay, great. Okay. Bye. So, John, uh, we have a lot of questions. I know. And many people are excited. So I'll, I'll go slowly, okay? And I might ask some people to, I'll ask some of the questions, and then I might ask some people um, that I know to unmute and show their cameras and, and talk about their questions. So we got a first question from um, Mr. Greg Butler from um, the Public Health Agency of Canada. He is asking about your experiences about uh, working with travel surveys. So you have been taking travel surveys from all over the world and, and you have been looking at different surveys and people are changing the surveys over time. So his main question, how are travel surveys evolving over time? Because in, in some of your research, you're going back 20 years. So they were not asking the same questions. They are now asking different questions. How are you have been accounting for that? I've seen some of your papers, even long, I'm not gonna say how long ago, that we're doing actually this for even earlier uh, papers. So how do you do that? And especially with survey responses falling these days, uh, uh, that Greg is asking, and also about uh, geolo like, and, and there are new geolocation tools being used uh, like accelerometers, mobiles, phones, wearable devices. How can you compare these together? It's a very, very good question. It's a little bit difficult to answer. This is what I would have given to Ralph because Ralph is actually the one who has used each of the travel survey data sets and has done the, the technical analysis, uh, however he's doing the, of the statistical analysis of these data sets. Uh, but the, the, we, I know for sure it, it is the comparability 
is an issue. It is a problem, uh, not only among countries and among cities. I even gave the example there for Chinese cities that they're just they're very different kinds of even definitions of, of modes and, and ways of collecting the data and so forth. Um, but even within the same country, so here in the United States, we have the National Household Travel Survey, and it has changed over time considerably. Uh, currently, there's a number of changes that have been made, but the most recent change um, was the, they found that there were originally random, what's it called, random digit dialing landlines. Well, as you can guess, a lower and lower percentage of households in the United States even have a landline. So random digit dialing of landlines was missing out on cell phone use. And so now the, the latest, I think they did it three years ago, the latest uh, national travel survey used a web-based kind of a survey design. They also had a little bit of landline survey. They had somewhat of a, a cell phone survey, but it was more web-based. And there was really no way that I'm aware of that, I mean, I'm sure they looked at the differences from the different methods, but it was, it's just it, very difficult to figure out what exactly what change was due to the different methodology. Um, and it, it, on the one hand, the web-based methodology was going to be more accessible to younger folks who, who use uh, the smartphones and, and all the digital stuff, uh, but less accessible to older adults. So um, even in the United States, definitions have also changed over time. So way back and well, going back the, the, before the NHTS, there was the NPTS, and there were even certain definitional issues. So I had always, I had published many articles uh, on each of the national travel surveys, and I'd always criticized that I thought that walking especially was undercounted because people just didn't consider a walk to be a real trip. Um, so then as a result, criticisms every five years or so, they changed the survey. And so then they had multiple prompts, five or six prompts saying, did you really not make a, a walk trip today? And it increased suddenly the percentage of trips uh, um, by walking because that was clearly a change in that methodology. So the, the long and the short of it is Ralph could answer it in more detail, but clearly it, there, it is a problem comparing surveys over countries. They're not completely comparable, that's for sure. We used the only national travel surveys available and the most recent available for each of these countries. So we did the best we could, but we really can't say, well, to this extent, they were not comparable. Um, and I'll just really, really, the most comparable surveys are the ones in the United States and Germany, because the last three German travel surveys were directly modeled on the American travel survey. So those are two probably the most comparable, but there are differences, there's no question. Okay, so another question from um, uh, Stephanie Prince from also Public Health Agency of Canada. What, what do you find is the best data or research to motivate change slash increasing in funding for cycling infrastructure uh, uh, or it's a whole package based on your experience? Like what, which research you felt this made a difference or that made a difference in changing how people think in terms of funding? Uh, because you have been working with around the world, I know that for sure. And well, interacting with different levels of government. In the United States, um, and this is true both at the national level, it's true at the state level, and it's often true at the city level as well. And that is uh, walking and cycling are combined in one package. And so funding, and this is just the way the formulas work uh, in the United States, that there's sort of one package combined of funding for walking and cycling facilities. And so it's, it's sort of a little bit difficult to figure out, well, exactly what is the funding for cycling and exactly what is the funding for walking? On top of that in the United States, um, that many times, cycling improvements, for example, new bike lanes, buffered bike lanes, even in some cases protected bike lanes, are funded whenever um, a roadway is widened or improved or repaved. And in many cities, it happens here in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
that the city just automatically then puts in a bike lane, sometimes with a buffer zone, um, and it gets charged to the highway project and not to cycling uh, funds. Um, and that's also true for, for walking facilities. Um, I'm not, each country has a different way of, um, of accounting for the funding for walking and cycling. I must tell you, and, and if, if we think it's difficult to do that sort of accounting here in North America, in Germany, which you think they'd have everything so structured and logical, even the Germans, they call the financing for walking and cycling uh, to be spaghetti financiero. It's spaghetti financing because it's just so interwoven and very, very difficult to figure out, well, how much was that really for cycling? How much was really for walking? That's just not the way they keep the books. So it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, but I must say there's, and this gets back to the implementation, getting increased funding for cycling and for, for active transportation as a package. I think it's fine. I mean, walking is a great mode of transportation. I think it ought to be funded just like cycling. Um, and, and I think it's really important. I'm so glad to have had these two questions from public health folks, because I think that the health benefits of cycling and of walking are probably the most important reason for promoting walking and cycling. I'm probably, I haven't thought about that. This is just my, my feeling that these health benefits are enormous. We have no idea. Well, I guess we do. There have been estimates of it, but they're very, very large. And, uh, and I really think that uh, emphasizing these health benefits of both walking and cycling are gonna be the key way to increase funding for walking and cycling. The, I, I don't think most, if you tell most voters in the United States, well, this is gonna uh, reduce climate change. It'll somehow mitigate global warming and do this. Most Americans are not gonna vote for that sort of funding and most politicians won't. If you tell people, you know, you're, it's gonna make you healthier uh, you're less likely to get killed uh, in, in a crash with a, a car, um, and you're going to live longer. I mean, that it gives each individual voter, each individual person who has influence on policymaking, it gives them an incentive to support active travel. And here, I, 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 there was a question also I saw that came up on recreational cycling. And uh, which I think is fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, I think they're cycling for all sorts of purposes. I'm retired, semi-retired anyway. So most of the cycling I do is recreational cycling or exercise cycling or uh, I enjoy it. Um, and it's on the greenways. It's completely separate from motor vehicle traffic. It's more pleasant for me, it's safer for me and so forth. And on the greenways, and this is, I'll bet you this is true in Canadian cities as well. I see every conceivable segment of society. I see lots of older adults, even older than I am. <laughs> I mean, and on, a, on a weekday afternoon, I would guess over 50% of the cyclists on that greenway that I use are older adults. Uh, I see younger kids on the weekends. I, I see women, as many women as men, every conceivable demographic group, uh, ethnic group, and so forth. It's just... Uh, I, I think greenways are really, really important, and I don't think we should discount something cycling simply because it's for recreation or exercise. I think that's a, a crucial role that cycling plays. Okay, so let me go to Jason um, Stoffel. He asked a question about um, uh, going more than the cycling amenities as you're talking about the greenways, and he's talking, asking about how the current uh, bicycle facilities uh, need to change for the future because we started now we having um, from, we have been promoting uh, e-bikes we have been promoting uh, cargo bikes uh, we are getting more cargo bikes and e-bikes on the on the streets now and we are promoting in 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 some aspects the 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 bike delivery in in, in Montreal here by having e-bikes to deliver for uh, UPS and, and these kinds of things. So how much do we think we have to change facilities? Um, I, I think that many cities are in the process of doing just that. They're building uh, more integrated, they're integrating cycling networks across the communities in the metropolitan area. And this is happening right there in Montreal. It's happening in Vancouver. We have case studies that we're doing right now on Montreal and Vancouver, and both of them, have these, oh, what's the French word? The réseau vélo régional or something like that. Yeah. 
And so they, Montreal and also Vancouver are already in the process of building these, some people call them bicycle expressways, but they're, they're longer distance uh, uh, bikeways and they're meant for longer distance cyclists and, and it allows you to have a faster speed. Ralph showed you all the examples of that. And I think this is a huge trend in Europe. I mean, the, the, the Europe's at, they're really at the forefront of all this. I mean, every city I'm aware of in Europe is building this network of express bikeways because unlike what some people in, the, in North America think, European cities are suburbanizing as well. I mean, they've got suburbs, they have longer and longer trip distances. And so for them, it's also important to have these express bikeways. And the Netherlands has the most of all. And many, some people, because the cities are fairly close together, are cycling from city to city. So the, one, one of the ways you adapt to the longer distance trips and also the availability of e-bikes, which can cover longer distances, uh, is you build better longer distance facilities. And, and you coordinate me. And by the way, the, 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 I, I live here in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have, it's called the Triangle Area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. We have, actually, it's not small. We have 2 million people. So we're a village compared to Montreal, but we're not tiny. Uh, and we're, we even have a bicycle expressway that's in progress. I mean, it's being built right now. And, it's, and the, there's a lot of public support for it. And it's going from, from Raleigh to Cary to the Research Triangle Park to Durham and Chapel Hill. It's incredible. I never thought this would be possible here uh, in the Triangle area. Um, but I mean, it, it, it really is happening. And I see also on the greenways as well. The greenways are also longer distance. They're not necessarily made for commuting, but I see a lot of e-bikes used on the greenway. We have over 300 miles of greenways here in the Triangle areas. It's very popular. It's by the way, of all go local government expenditures here in the Triangle area, they've done a survey. The number one most popular local government expenditure is expanding the greenways. It's been that way for over a decade. So there's a lot of public support. Another question comes from um, Omar Jomar, who is um, one of the, uh, he's an advocate here in Montreal, and he is doing a great work on um, accessibility and universal access on uh, making sure that the, the metro and, and advocating for the metro to be fully accessible in Montreal. And he's asking about what are your thoughts in terms of uh, sharing the bike lanes with wheelchairs or the, the electric uh, wheelchairs and scooters and sometimes or so should they be limited to the sidewalks? Uh, what's your thoughts about that from a safety standpoint based on your experience or what you have been seeing around the world? I'm not sure I quite understood that. We're saying to... Uh, to allow uh, uh, an electric wheelchair, for example, on a bike lane. So someone on, and someone on a wheelchair and someone on a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, so so they go a little bit faster than walking. They're slower than cycling. So should you leave them on the sidewalk? Some of them wants to jump on the on the bike lanes. So we are building a lot of bike lanes in Montreal now. So what are your thoughts about that point of, of the idea of mixing that might happen on the bike lanes? It's the same question similar to um, when, when you share with e-scooters, but here you're sharing with someone on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Well, I would certainly give priority to someone in a wheelchair over someone on an e-scooter, I must say. I mean, I, I would really say that the person in the e-wheelchair um, maybe should have a choice. I mean, the, but sometimes the, the reason I say that is because sometimes the sidewalk is not in good enough condition. They're not, at least here in the United States, they're sometimes unlevel uh, or there are potholes on the sidewalk. They're not well-maintained. Um, and, and you don't have to, if you're in a wheelchair, then if you're in the, in the bike lane, you don't have to worry. You're at the same level when you cross the intersection. You're not having to go up and down and up and down. So I, I can see arguments uh, sort of in, in, in both directions why some people might feel more comfortable in a wheelchair and e-wheelchair on the sidewalk. Others, I mean, they're not going to be, I have not in my entire life seen someone in a wheelchair zooming past me where I really thought that was a danger. And maybe it happens, but I, I haven't found that to be a danger on, on the sidewalk. What I have found to be a danger are the e-scooters because people, I mean, most 
here in Raleigh, we have gazillions of them. The, um, it's usually younger folks who are using the e-scooters, not always, but it's usually younger adults who are using the e-scooters. And what I found is just unbelievably illegal and dangerous behavior on the part of these users going through uh, red lights, stop signs, and uh, zigzagging uh, across the road. I mean, they, they scare me. And I mean, they are, have been, there've been many, many uh, crashes here in Raleigh because of them. Michelle, who's a student in the class that, uh, the, that's taking the class, she's asking, how do we decide whether to invest money in getting more people to cycle versus more people on, on public transit, for example? So how would you, when you have limited resources, uh, transit is more expensive, I know that, but if you have money and you're going to allocate, how would you prioritize? <laughs> well, there really are limited resources. And it really is much more expensive, uh, depending on what kind of public transit, but it's still much more expensive uh, expanding and improving public transport than it is improving cycling. Uh, well, I, wish I, had, I wish I had the numbers at my fingertips, but for example, the, the, in Manhattan, in New York City, uh, they, they recently built the Second Avenue subway line. They're not finished with it yet. I think it's five stations. And it cost, I believe, it was an average of almost $2 billion per mile, $2 billion per mile. And compare that to the $2 billion a year spent on walking and bicycling projects by the federal government for the entire country for an entire year. That's compared to $2 billion for one mile of a subway. Now, of course, there, there, I think that when it comes to public transport, that uh, I think much more consideration should be put into bus rapid transit. I mean, that it's, it's less expensive. I'm not saying it's perfect. And I do love the metro system there in Montreal. I really, really do. Um, but sometimes, I mean, I think the bus rapid transit is sometimes an alternative. It's certainly, it's faster. It's much, much faster to implement. It's cheaper to implement. And it can also be more flexible. I'm not sure how much, how many people in the audience are familiar with, with Ontario, uh, Ottawa rather. Ottawa was a pioneer here in North America when it came to bus rapid transit. It had by far the largest bus rapid transit system. It wasn't called that at the time, but that's what it was. They had busways and so forth. And you were able uh, to get on a local bus in your neighborhood. And then it went on to these sort of, uh, they were feeder routes into the trunk route of the system which took you then to downtown Toronto, which is a very, it means you have the, 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 what we call the trunk system. Uh, you're not having to transfer to get from your residential neighborhood to downtown and, and reverse. So I, mean, I, I, I think that there's something to be said for considering more use of bus rapid transit and for upgrading uh, even just regular bus service. But it's, it's a big dilemma. I mean, I, I am a huge fan of public transport but it does take a lot of money. And um, I mean, it, we really do have to look at them as a package. But when I think of the Second Avenue subway, I'm just thinking for what one mile costs, that's enough you know, for a huge amount of improvement in cycling facilities uh, in, in New York City. Uh, someone, by the way, asked a question. I'm trying to think of what it was now. Um, Oh, go ahead. Just go ahead and ask. Okay. I'll, I'll go to uh, Zvi, who's, uh, who's a cycling advocate here in Montreal. Uh, he's asking about um, the trend that you were explaining about the Anglo countries tend to value individual rights and the right to drive over the collective needs. And he's asking, might this be the source of the disparities that we find, how street space is also allocated? Do you think so? I think it is. I think it is a, an important reason. I think in European, there's two reasons for this also. In European countries, that car ownership came much later than it did in the United States. And so it was easier to introduce restraints on cars, whether it be parking or car-free zones or traffic calming, um, that um, there was a much lower percentage of the population that owned and used cars on a regular basis. So politically, it has been much easier to implement car restrictive measures in these European countries than in 
the, that in North America or, or in Australia. So um, I, I do think, and, the, and just the, the nature of, of, there really is a difference in culture in Europe versus North America. I mean, there's, we've sort of grown up with the car being part of our daily life. And in Europe, they do have I mean, a very high rate of car, car ownership, but they have a much, much, much lower rate of car use. And there seems to be this a willingness, a voluntary willingness to accept restraints on car use in return for what they see as being a healthier, more livable uh, urban environment, a more sustainable city and a more sustainable transport system, even if it means making certain sac sacrifices on their own. So they're not able to use their car to drive through the center of the city to get to the other side. Many European cities make it impossible to do that, but in the United States, you can do it in virtually any city. So here's a question on health, but also related to the comparisons between cities uh, that came from uh, Vanessa Ocean. And she's asking, do you observe different impacts of, of safer cycling infrastructure and other health benefits of cycling but when you look between countries, those who has universal health care versus those who don't have universal health care? So you're in the States, uh, so you know the difference. And, and, and I know you go to Europe a lot, so you see the difference. Well, you know, I thought you were going to ask a different question, so maybe I'll answer the one that I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll ask, it'll be a public health, but that is something that surprised me. If you compare level um, among maybe it's 15 or so countries in Europe, Canada, the United States, and Australia, if you compare different levels of obesity, if you compare longevity, how many uh, was the average lifetime? The, uh, actually, the way they do it is average healthy lifetime that is without a major disability. The countries with the highest levels of walking and cycling have the lowest levels of obesity, longer life expectancies and longer healthy life expectancies than we have in the United States. Um, and I think a longer than in Canada as well. Um, even though in the United States, I believe the figure is we spend three times more per person in dollars on medical expenses on healthcare costs than Europeans do, uh, and yet they live longer, they're healthier. Uh, it's, it's, I think there's a huge public health rationale for promoting active transportation and, and for making it safer uh, at the same time. Uh, Misha Young, who's a professor in, in, in Toronto, is asking about, um, uh, uh, have there, uh, like the increase in cycling in mode share that you have seen over the years, how many of these are coming from transit and walking and how many of them are coming from cars, for example? So are we, are we like we are investing in cycling? Are we just bringing people out of transit because it's, it's becoming too crowded and that's it? We're not, how many are we bringing off a vehicle? Well, I think uh, a lot of the increased cycling, it depends from city to city, I'm sure, but what I've, what I've seen is that the increase in cycling, it, it hasn't really uh, discouraged so much, uh, it's discouraged short transit trips. So that the cycling is often more convenient, it's obviously cheaper, faster often, um, to cover a short distance than it is to wait for a bus or, or to walk to the metro station, take the metro, if it's just a short distance. So what's happened is it's, it's those shorter transit trips, whether they're bus or maybe one or two stops on the Metro that end up um, getting made by cycling instead of getting made by public transit. Longer transit trips, so longer bus trips or longer Metro trips are not being reduced as a result of the investment in cycling. And then in terms of walking, it's hard to say. Uh, most, you know, the, 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 it, Often it's assumed that uh, people will walk. I mean, this is on a daily walk to get to work or to get to the transit station. The people are willing to walk about a mile or half a mile and so forth. Um, and of course, the improving bike transit integration is encouraging people to cycle to the transit station instead of walking to the transit station. 
uh, but it also makes it cheaper and just you know, not bad having to take the bus to the to the transit station. So there's a little bit of competition there as well. So you could you have the option: do you want to walk to that transit station or do you want to cycle to the transit station? So there is some competition between public transit and cycling, um, and there's some competition between walking and cycling. Um, but in some cases, it's actually, uh, for example, in uh, looking at the, we were in part, as part of this Vancouver case study, it turns out that the inner, and this is true for actually a number of cities, the inner portions of their metro systems, or in Vancouver, it's I think the Sky, Sky Train, I'm not sure exactly what they call it there, um, but the inner portions of the metro systems are actually overcrowded, this is before COVID, overcrowded during rush hours on weekdays. And so getting people to make those shorter transit trips by bicycling actually reduce the overcrowding on exactly the part of the metro system that was overcrowded. So in a sense that the bicycling was helping public transit in two different ways. Number one, it was reducing the use of central city, uh, the, the center portions of the metro system, which was overcrowded. Second benefit for transit of cycling is as a feeder network. So instead of having to run lots of local bus services to feed the metro stations, you can have less bus services and instead feed those metro stations with uh, better cycling routes. So that they can work, you, you can look at them either way. They, they can be very complementary, but in some respects, they could also be competitive. Okay, so um, speaking of public consultations, uh, Justine was asking about uh, what sort of consultations should be done prior to introducing bike lanes. So here we see in Montreal, a lot of back and forth in some bike lanes about uh, the impacts on commercial streets and um, impacts on businesses. And then we see a lot of fight from the car, cars and, and uh, the parking and uh, some merchants are unhappy about that. So, and some of the consultations can take for a very long time to, to install the bike lanes. So can you reflect on, on, on on, on your experience, how you have been seeing the consultations going on in different bike lanes and things like that? Well, I'm going to cite an article in your very own journal. <laughs> and I think Susan Handy was one of the- Yeah, Susan and, 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 and Jane. It, it was looking exactly at this issue and they did a survey of all the studies available on what are the economic impacts of installing a bike lane uh, on the businesses along that route. And the overwhelming uh, number of studies found a positive impact. That is the businesses gained more customers by improving the cycling and also the walking facilities uh, along these businesses and instead taking away parking spaces. So the, the, but the businesses were afraid. I mean, the businesses are terrified, oh, we're going to lose customers because you're taking away parking spaces in front of our businesses, and they, they're they misinformed. <laughs> when they do these studies, they find, well, it's surprising how many customers get to those businesses by walking or cycling, and fewer by car. So um, it, part of it is maybe um, educating the businesses uh, on just what the benefits are, and, and in these consultations with businesses, and you I mean, you have to get the business community on board to present some evidence and say, look, these are some specific cases in cities X, Y, Z, and these corridors, and actually the, 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 the volume of business increased. And, and another example of this is with traffic, oh, car-free zones. Um, everyone probably knows the famous car-free zone in the middle of Copenhagen, which originally was extremely controversial. It was introduced as a very controversial sort of a trial, a test project, experiment. Um, well, it was successful. It was so successful that the businesses were booming that were in this car-free zone. It was, they were originally opposed to it. And then to their surprise and pleasure, they had much more business than any of the other areas. So then the, the businesses in the surrounding areas said, we insist on being part of this car-free zone as well. So we also can have booming business. So it's, you know, it's like uh, 
this is why we say if it's a controversial policy, whether it's putting it a bike lane or cycle track or car free zone or, or something like this, it, introduce it in stages because you can see if you can document the success and you can allay the fears of some of the, uh, the opponents, especially the, the businesses that they're not going to lose business, they're going to probably get more business. Uh, then uh, let me ask the last question. It's, it's more about what are your suggestions for countries with low cycling rates owing to cultural uh, reasons? This is from Mehdi Balati. Uh, what are your suggestions for countries with low cycling rates owing to cultural reasons, how they can probably um, uh, counteract cultural hindrance? That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> there are countries, there are cultures uh, where cycling is simply not an acceptable form of getting around, especially for women. And so that is really, there can be a cultural obstacle to introducing cycling. I mean, that, that's not really, that's not the case in the United States, or for most parts sorry, of the United States, Canada, and Australia, but it is the case in some Middle Eastern countries uh, in, in many Islamic countries, uh, the women just are not supposed to be riding a bike. In fact, in the Netherlands, I mean, there's there's quite a large Islamic population there that came from Indonesia, and they have special bike training for women who have sort of overcome this cultural barrier. So it, if it's a cultural barrier or a religious barrier, I'm not sure how much can be done about that. But in many of these, in, in these cities, for example, Bogota, Colombia had almost no cycle before they started their big program. And then they went from zero. The same thing was true in uh, Seville, Spain. They went from almost no cycling to a very high level of cycling. So just the fact that you don't have a cycling culture and you have almost no cycling doesn't mean you can't start it out. It's, it's more difficult, I would say, starting from zero than it is starting from half of a percent or a percent, but uh, it's possible. Okay, thank you so much, John. Really appreciate You're welcome. your time. And really appreciate sticking out with us all that after the, the, the talk. Uh, it was a pleasure and it's always a pleasure to meet with you and to talk with you. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll bring you in person one day soon to Montreal to give us other talks to you and Ralph. Well, I'd love to do it because I'm, I'm looking at the skyline of Montreal in the background here. I'm thinking, I want to be there. <laughs> I Thank love you. Quebec. I, have, I don't know why. I have always loved Quebec. I have always loved Montreal and Quebec City. Uh, and there's just something. In fact, I, just so everyone knows, I mean, actually, I'm, uh, I'm taking a course. They have these senior courses at NC State here in Raleigh. And I'm taking a six-week course on the history and culture of Quebec believe it or not. <laughs> so uh, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, John. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. And thanks to Bye. everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone to for... everyone for attending the talk. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. And thanks